In this video, we're finally going to get to a place where we can actually start manipulating matrices to the extent that we'll be able to use them to find solutions to linear systems of linear equations. I'm going to start with uh, the matrix that you see here, uh, but before we actually dive into that, I want to take a minute and remind you of the elementary row operations. Remember that so far what we've learned to do with matrices is that we can swap two rows. Um, I've used the IJ not notation here just to um, make sure that the um, the idea that I'm expressing is is quite generic. So I can I can swap row I and row J. I can multiply row I any row by uh, any real number, and that includes fractions and it includes negative numbers, right? So I could turn say this. Um, first row here into 393 three, 300 just by multiplying by by the number 3. And the, all I'm really doing there is multiplying the equation 3x, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here, x plus 3y plus z equals 100. I'm multiplying both sides of that equation by 3. That gives me 3x plus 9y plus 3z equals 300, and in matrix form, that would be 3, 9, 3, 300. So by scaling a row, all I'm doing is skipping the step where I have to worry about writing out the variables. All right, I'm going to erase that now. All right, so I can scale a row. Um, and the third rule as presented in your book is that you can add a row to a scaled row and replace that. I'm going to put R, I don't know, RJ there. Uh, replace the second row with, with the, the sum of a scaled first row and a, the second row, a, a scaled row and another row. Um, I think this is kind of overstating it, actually. If you think about it, um, if I just say that I can add row I and row J and replace either row I or row J with that new one, um, I could scale row I by this property and then add my new row I to row J and replace row J. So it this last sort of property here is kind of overstating things. That's how your book has it. I'm, I'm going to leave it like that. But I, I tend to think of it more in terms of just I can add two rows. So these are really the same thing. Okay. Now, the goal of this video is to show you how to put, or one way, to put a matrix into echelon form. We're going to do that with the, the matrix that you see on the screen here. And there are sort of several different approaches that you might take. The order of the steps in algorithm 1.6.1 uh, that are presented in your textbook are not necessarily the way I would think of it, but they're not wrong. Um, the steps here say to find the current pivot of the first column. Uh, and it, as a reminder, it says the current pivot is the first non-zero entry in a matrix column. Right, so that would be the number one here. Uh, step two says if the current pivot is not in the first row, switch the first row at the with the row that contains the current pivot. In other words, if you have a zero in that position, then you, you might want to switch row two into row one's position so that you can so that you have a pivot in that first position. Step three sounds easy enough. Perform elementary row operations using the current pivot so that all entries below the current pivot are zeros. Well, that sounds really simple, right? And in fact, it is, but there's a lot in that sentence. Um, the th the thing to keep in mind is that you want to use the current pivot. That's the thing that gets forgotten quite frequently. Here what we're going to do is we're going to use the number 1 to turn the 2 below it and the 2 below that into zeros. All right, And I'm going to do that using elementary row operations. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take row 1 and I'm going to multiply it by negative 2 because I know that ultimately I'm going to add it to this row, and adding a negative 2 times 1 to a positive 2 will cancel them out. 
And, and what I want is to put a, a, a zero in the first position of row two. So I'm going to take negative two times row one. I'm going to add that to row two, and I'm going to put that into row two. So that's the operation that I'm going to do here, elementary row operation number three. And when I do, I get for my new row two, let's see, I'll do this. Row one stays the same, one, three, one, 100. Row two now, however, is going to be negative two times row one, position one. So negative two times one is negative two. And I'm going to add negative two to positive two, and I'm going to put it here. Then I'm going to take negative two times position two, three, so that gives me negative six. And I'm going to add it to row two. It gives me a one. Negative two times one is negative two. Negative two plus three is one. Negative two times 100 is negative 200. Adding that to 500 gives me 300. OK. Um, and then doing one operation at a time, my second, my third row does not change. But because I also have a two here, and I want zeros below everything except for the pivot in this column, uh, I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm going to take negative two times row one, and this time I'm going to add it to row three. And that's going to give me a new row three. So uh, negative two times position one is negative two. Negative two times, oh, I didn't give myself anywhere to put that. My first row is like this. I've changed my second row now so that it is now zero, one, one, 300. And I'm in the process now of changing my third row. So I'll start over. Negative 2 times position 1 is negative 2. You add that to positive 2 and you get 0. Negative 2 times position 2 is negative 6. Negative 6 plus 4 is negative 2. And negative 2 times 1 is negative 2. Negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1. Negative 2 times 100 is 2. Negative 200. Negative 200 plus negative 100 is negative 300. Now remember that all I'm really doing here is multiplying negative 2 uh, uh, by both sides of the equation x plus 3y plus z equals 100. Right? So this is a completely legal thing to do, and it's really not that mysterious. I'm allowed to multiply a row by a number because I'm multiplying an equation, both sides of an equation, by that number. I'm allowed to add two equations together, or two rows together, in the same way that I would add two equations together when I was solving a system of equations in that sort of algebraic form. So now I've got a new matrix, basically, to play with. And step four of this process is to repeat steps one through three. So find the pivot. Um, if it's not the right position, switch rows, and then use elementary row operations, as we just did. But it says to repeat those steps for the submatrix containing, I'm going to use a different color here, the submatrix containing all entries below and to the right of the current pivot. Well, the current pivot is 1. That's the one I've been playing with. And I want to be below and to the right. I think I'll use a slightly different shape of arrow there. Below and to the right. So there's this submatrix down here. It's these entries right here. So now I'm going to do the exact same thing, but with those uh, with those entries. So the first thing I need to do is find my pivot, and that is for that submatrix. That is this number one here, and then I'm going to use that number to make sure that everything below it is a zero. Well, in this case, I only have one thing below it. That's that negative two, and so I need to find a uh, a number that I can multiply row. Well, you know what? I'm going to call these, I'm going to continue calling them row two and three. So I want to take row two, really just the the um, numbers in the submatrix that you say here. I can include these numbers here, but as you can see now they're, they're zero. It's not going to have any effect on the result. So I want to take row two, and I want to multiply it by something so that when I add it to row three, I end up with a, a zero in that first position. 
and I'm going to put that into row 3. I'm going to make that my new row 3. So what can I multiply 1 by to get the opposite of 2? And the answer is 2. All right, so let's do it. 2 times position 2, because I'm in column 2. I know I know my submatrix looks like that's the first column. It's the first column of the submatrix. But for consistency's sake, I'm going to continue thinking of this as position 2. So I'm going to take 2 times position 2 add it to negative 2. I've done this again. I haven't given myself anywhere, anywhere to work, anywhere to write my result. Okay, 2 times position 2, add that to negative 2, you get 0. 2 times 1, you get 2, add that to negative 1, and you get 1. 2 times 300 is 600, add that to negative 300, you get negative 300. Okay, and I still have a zero here. Now I could also have said two times zero, add that to zero, and you get zero. So that's that's not going to change anything. The last step, step five says step step five says stop when the entries below each pivot are zero. Well, let's find our pivots and make sure that we are in the position to be able to stop. Uh, let's use blue. There's the pivot here. Everything below that is a zero, so I'm, I'm good there. Everything below this one is a zero, and there are no rows below this one, so that is also a pivot. Uh, I have three pivot columns. I could go on and talk about, well, I have three pivot columns and three variables, or I have no non-pivot columns, and therefore I know I'm going to have a, a system here. I'm going to have a consistent system. So, But I'm not going to uh, necessarily go into that detail now. What I've done is I've put this... Um, matrix into echelon form. And the benefit of that is that now, if I wanted to, I could say, well, look here, hang on, I'm, I'm uh, struggling with getting the right pen to do the job here. Um, I could say, well, I now know, <laughs> I now know that x sub 3, or z if you prefer, equals negative 300. And since I know that, and since I know that x2 plus x3 equals 300, but x3 equals negative 300, add 300 to both sides, and you get x2 equals 600. And since x2 equals 600, I can write x1 plus 3 times x2 plus x3 equals 100, but I know x2 equals 600 and x3 equals negative 300, so I can come up with uh, a value for x1 as well. Let's see, that would be x1 plus 18 minus 3 is 1500. That equals 100. Subtracting 1500 from both sides gives me x1 equals negative 1400. So there's my value for x1, there's my value for x2, and there's my value for x3. So the fact that this is an echelon form lets me take that last step if there's a solution and figure out what that solution is. I can also write this in the form negative 1400, 600, negative 300. I'm going to call that good for the lecture video. If I get a chance, I'll try to provide a supplementary video with just another example of how to do this on a different matrix. But that's going to do it for this one.